Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Block Series speakers. Uh, I'll turn, the, turn it over to Anthony Kaiser. here. Thank you very much for attending. That was the shortest intro that I can I'm nervous tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much, Randy. And I uh, really thank you guys for coming out to the uh, uh, center for the uh, Library for the Archives of History. And it's a great honor that we can continue to have these block speaker series programs here. And we can enjoy each other's company as we uh, enter the door, talk about old times, and, and uh, be gracious and cordial to one another as we're enjoying ourselves. The West Virginia Center for African American Art and Culture has been putting these Lux series on since 2014. And you as an audience have been grateful, or rather gracious in being here. And I'm very thankful that you see yourself being a part of what we're doing. Our guests, our speakers have been phenomenal. And uh, they have enlightened me to the history of Charleston that we want to preserve. And with your help, we'll continue to do this. As I said, the, the organization is a, is a nonprofit, tax exempt organization. We have other ideas planned for the upcoming years. Uh, continuing the Block Speaker Series is a, is a main focus of ours, but other projects are in the planning stages. We'd like for you to uh, take a, one of our, from the cards are gone for our upcoming speaker series uh, next month, 31st of August. Our Ms. Chloe Carter, Ms. Chloe, will be our guest. She's one of our dedicated board members for the organization. And uh, we are looking for other members to be a part of our organization and help us plan our other programs that we have on the agenda. Uh, as I said, we are a nonprofit organization. If you would like to consider making a contribution to the organization, we gratefully accept your help uh, financially as we reach out for your help uh, physically, joining with us in our programming ideas. We want to continue what we're doing <clears throat> into the uh, 19. Uh, 2019, 2020 years, we plan to reach out to as far away as Huntington and uh, incorporate our Block Speaker Series program. Because the concept of the Block Speaker Series is more than just, as I said, Charleston and the Shrewsbury Street area. <clears throat> the concept of the Block is much larger because what I've learned is that those who are speaking for the Block Speaker Series have a common thread in their, in their presentation, is their teaching, their upbringing, their life, how their community, their parents, their teachers were all a part of their lives. They were inspired by their neighbors to be more than they thought they could be. Their neighbors were their parents, you would say, corrected them when they were doing wrong. And when they got home, they were corrected again. <laughs> 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 that reaching out to their neighbors, their community, I personally think is what's lacking in the generations that have been following your generation. That lack of discipline that was given not necessarily by the strap or by the back of the hand, but by verbal commands. You do what you're told. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. <coughs> yes, sir, no, sir. Uh, the teachers in the schools taught you. You learned what you were taught. And that's the common thread that I find in these individuals who are our past speakers and who will be our upcoming speakers. 
you can go to Huntington and find that common thread in the people that I've begun to talk to. And that's what I want to put across to a younger audience that you bring into this <coughs> auditorium to learn how to respect your elders, to learn how to respect the members of the community, and learn from your neighbors as well as <coughs> respecting them in every way possible. We have today Reverend Dr. Paul H. Eason, who is a daughter graduate, who is a Charlestonian, <coughs> who has those qualities that I just spoke about. He has taken the two different corners of the earth and have inspired, dedicated his life to those teachings that he received when he was younger. You, as well as he, show those in everything that you do. And I learn from you as you come to the door, <coughs> shaking each other's hand, laughing with each other, recalling earlier times. I enjoy seeing and hearing that. And I want to continue that inspiration to a younger generation, that they can rely on you. They can rely on each other to be inspirational to achieve more than they think they can. But I want to continue with our speaker series tonight with uh, Reverend Paul Eason. You all know him. <laughs> we came to the door, grabbing and hugging each other. <laughs> Miss Reed, the lady in the front seat here, you know her. That was really that was inspirational for me to see. Very happy to see that. As you greeted each other, you were very happy to see that. That's the gratefulness that I am with you guys, and what you showed that uh, is 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 exudes your uh, happiness to be here and uh, have fun with each other. What Reverend Easton would do tonight is talk about his life, how he's been inspired by Charleston, the community, reveal some things that I didn't know about him that very inspired. Medal of Honor recipient? No. Brown Star. Brown Star recipient? <laughs> <laughs> Brown Star recipient. And, uh, uh, very intellectual man to listen to. And I want to uh, uh, bring him up front here, Reverend Dr. Paul H. Easley. It's a very emotional moment for me to be here uh, to uh, share some God's blessings that's given to me and to you. And I'm very appreciative to the West Virginia Center for African American Art and Culture, and, uh, Mr. Kinzer, and my cousin, Barbara Hicks Lacey. It was her encouragement and talk to me the reason I'm here. And I appreciate, Barbara, you've always impacted my life uh, to be uh, selected as the two, uh, 2017 Block Speaker Series a perspective of African-American life uh, for this July presentation. I, I want to share with you an introspective insight and observation that I feel that have impacted the block history. Uh, and that is uh, not too far, located too far, here's a street called Cent Street. <laughs> it's located about one block east of Shrewsbury and sometimes you can miss it, but it is a street called Cent Street there. <clears throat> I was born on the west side of Charleston uh, to the parents of Alexander Pamplin and Estelle Allen Easley on September the 7th, 1930. Our first household on the west side of Charleston on 4th Avenue across from then was located a main local dump. 
across the railroad tracks. It was there that we hustled our livelihood and food. And I attended Ebenezer Baptist Church because of their active uh, vacation Bible class there on 3rd Avenue. They had food. <laughs> <laughs> well, because of the sickness of my grandmother, Ms. Ursula Allen, my mother moved to the east side of town on Cent Street where our grandmother raised and babysit for the family until her death. She was a blind widow. Upon moving, we attended Simpson Memorial Methodist Church. It was Methodist then, located on Shrewsbury Street, about two blocks from our home on Cent Street, where we became members, active members. It was at the age of four, we had our first contact and experience with what we call the central jurisdiction of the Methodist Episcopal Church. It was then segregated. And our mother, our mother required all of us to attend church activities and worship services every, every week where we were active in the church choir, the Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, Drama Youth, MYF. And we all attended Boyd uh, School and later Garnet High School, public schools. Uh, I was very active in those uh, schools that I attended, and very active kid outside also. Our music director at Simpson was Miss, was then Mrs. Catherine Mickey, the music teacher at Boyd. Mr. Boyd was the principal of Boyd Elementary and Junior High, and later Mr. Preston became principal. Uh, Cent Street uh, was called the east side of town, located, as I said, one block from the block. And the block included Doc Saul's drugstore and Doc Mitchell's drugstore, uh, who uh, was the husband of the Garnet Woman's basketball coach, as we all know. The block included the American Legion Club, Lawyer Brown's office. Joe Turner's mother operated a beauty parlor next to it. Around the corner uh, was a pool hole on, off of Strews, Strewsbury, on Strewsbury Street that was Flat Tires Barbershop. It was a, who also operated the Willow Bend Swimming Rec Area located in St. Albans called Willow Bend Beach. He drove a one and a half ton truck that transported many people to Willow Bend on weekends in that flat bed truck as I remember. The central place of the block then was the Ferguson Theater, which was located just below the Ferguson Hotel on Washington Street. Our area on that block on Washington Street was integrated. We had a white owner who operated a print shop. I took printing at Boyd and I used to help him. And also uh, someone operated a, a restaurant. On the east side of the theater was another barber shop located on Washington Street and another pool hall located around the corner of the barber shop uh, called Spurlock Alley. Is that right? Across the street on Washington Street was a place called White Diners Inn. It was a black couple that did it, very fair complected couple, but I don't know why they call it White Diners. <laughs> <laughs> Which housed a restaurant and a boarding house where many of the big band leaders like Count Basie, Nat King Cole, Lionel Hampton, Dizzy Gillespie came and stayed and ate there. My mother washed uh, the shirts and ironed them at 25 cents apiece for many of those band leaders because Paul used to run around and I'd get acquainted with a lady over at the White's Diner and I knew these. Uh, Lionel Hampton used to go through 15 or 20 shirts during his concert and I picked them up and take them home to my mother who, owned, who ironed these shirts, washed these shirts with her hand, the last soap she made, and with an iron that we had to heat on the stove. It wasn't no electric iron, and she did an excellent job. She uh, charged 25 cents a piece uh, for the shirts. Uh, and next to it was First Baptist Church, where uh, I found out the former pastor was Mordecai Johnson. Is that right? Now, we get to Cent Street. That's what I want to share with you about Cent Street. Cent Street was the street I lived on. 
and some very famous people came off of Stan Street, Andrew, and Ann and Audrey Fontenot. I later met them in New York. She's a clothes designer and a saleswoman. Doc Alexander, who was a musician, and Ann Catherine Flagg, we all remember her. She moved to Cleveland, Ohio, but she was a Broadway actor and director. Ann was tremendous, lovely person. Major Joe Jackson and Miss Carrie Jackson. Joe Jackson was a World War I vet and a local American Legion organizer. His wife, Miss Carrie Jackson, had a beauty parlor next to my house, our house rather, located, uh, we lived at 460 Cent Street and they lived at 458. Uh, and Jim Taylor lived at the front of Cent Street. He was, they called him Fat Man. He was a shoe shine. He had a shoe shine parlor on Shrewsbury Street. One of the Prestons, school teacher, and Mr. Lemons, uh, who had a local truck contracting business. Uh, David Coleman, who later located uh, to Philadelphia, was on the city council there. Johnny Hughes, a musician who located to Philly also. And Albert Coleman of the Coleman Brothers Dry Cleaning, located on Court Street. And the Collin Brothers, William and Billy, artists and football star. And Emma Jean Fowler, I'll never forget that. That was the first little girl I liked and we used to meet down in Sense Court, which is down the other end. That we saw that picture of Sense Court uh, in the newspaper. And Mr. Ferguson, who worked for the state capital here, and he was a courier, I think, but he's the one that used to send me every year the West Virginia Blue Book I bought up and gave to uh, uh, Mr. Kent and uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Old age gets me at times, sir. <laughs> uh, uh, he was a courier here at the state capitol, and he lived next door to us at 450 and a half Cent Street in the back house where Mrs. Jackson owned. And my brother, Alexander, who was an auto mechanic, body repairman at Pritchard Motors, that was uh, the back of Pritchard Motors was on Cent Street, and I used to st steal off on his little Indian motorcycle at first, and that's where I learned how to ride the motorcycle, and I loved uh, that. Uh, he was a World War II veteran, served in the Navy, uh, was then served in the Navy when it was segregated. Uh, he was with uh, a Navy group that invaded Okinawa, and they were like uh, Navy engineers, like CBs. And uh, I found out his unit consisted of about 362 uh, black soldier, sailors, rather. And on the invasion, there were I think 89 of them left, and they were, the rest of those were killed in the invasion, but my brother was one of them that was, that uh, was uh, saved. And of course my brother, baby brother Robert Easley, who was a center standard officer, he attended Garnet and Boyd, he worked at the Job Corps downtown, and all of us uh, attended the local schools, but my brother's and I uh, were graduates of then West Virginia State College or the Technical Institute. Now, my father was an orthopedic orderly. And uh, the story goes, I remember uh, when he was on Kenora Boulevard one time, he fell in a hole under repair on Kenora Boulevard and came out of the place, set his own leg, hobbled to local hospital, I think it was Kenora Valley Hospital then, uh, went to the emergency clinic where he worked and set his own leg and put his own casket on. My mother, who was a beautician because of the increase in our family, later worked as a housemaid for very wealthy white families in the Capitol Hills and Edgewood uh, sections of Charleston. Now my mother had, uh, and my mother and father had eight siblings. One of my brothers, my oldest Brother, I didn't get to meet till later on, but he was a Reverend A.H. Easley, an Episcopal priest uh, who was a dean at St. Paul College in Lawrenceville, Virginia. And then one of my uh, oldest siblings that lived with us was Alexander Pamplin Easley Jr., Beatrice Ursula Gore, Elizabeth Ann Jenkins, Robert Edward, Jean Dolores Hicks, Alice Vernice, and they all have preceded me in death. Uh, I 
came out of Simpson ME Church located on Sudsbury Street where I said we were had our membership. And it was at the age of four we had our first contact and experience with what we call then in the Methodist Church was the central jurisdiction of the Methodist Episcopal Church. It was then segregated, as I said. Our mother required all of us to attend all the activities and worship service every week where we active in the church choir, the Boy Scouts, the Cub Scouts, drama, youth, and MYF activities. Um, I had my first business working at a local Kroger's grocery store, and I went by there where the post office is now. But the Kroger's was there, and I used to carry people's groceries for them. Located later on on Broad Street, and the back entrance was on Cent Street. But I later became employed at a local gas station that was located across from Kroger's, but where now where the post office is. And uh, during the week, uh, Leon Sullivan, Dr. Leon Sullivan, and I used to go around and gather up discarded wine bottles, and we'd sell them at Gates Paint Shop. I'll never forget that I was a little young kid with him with our Kroger sack uh, to help support our families. And during my junior high and high school school days, under the guidance of Miss Catherine Mickey, I became and began my musical career singing throughout the community. And I was the first Afro-American to sing on the Young Stars of Tomorrow uh, at the local WCHS station where I worked across the street from on Lee Street. In high school, I was a member of the Garnet Marching Band, the Glee Club, French Club, speech, speech Choir, and Basketball Junior Varsity and Track Team. And I became a member of a group called the Blue Doves. It was a vocal group, group uh, and I was a lead singer, and we won many contests uh, in the community and in the church. The group, the group included uh, Charles Robinson, I forgot Bird's first name, the one that played basketball, the Hancocks, and myself. And it, it, it garnered under the leadership of Mrs. Norman, our speech choir participated in a program at what was called the Old Civic Center. And uh, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt came there to be the speaker that day. Uh, who was the wife of President Roosevelt, and I got a chance to shake her hand, and she encouraged me. She really, I left there, and I didn't wash my hand for about a week. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I really, I really, that I never will forget that that uh, impact. She made me feel like a person. Uh, and after graduation from high school in 1950, I enlisted in the West Virginia Army National Guard which was activated on California Avenue here and during the Korean War. And I served with the 254th Transportation Truck Company, the 126th Truck Battalion, and Captain Ro uh, Robinson was our commander. And I reached the rank of sergeant uh, after discharging uh, from active duty. Um, uh, when I came back from our active duty, I came out early so I could attend West Virginia State College to finish my graduation. I, I wanted to be a missionary. And I tell you an experience that happened. I worked uh, at a, uh, a parking lot, Texaco service station garage located across from WCHS. And a gentleman named, named Mr. Emory Powell took me in because I used to come around there and hang around. And I guess I hung around so much he allowed me to start washing the cars and helping them washing the cars and I used to uh, clean the cars there. And the reason I like to clean the cars is because people used to say, boy, that easily, a boy, he can really wash the cars. Well, I'd take the seats out the back because people lose money in the back. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't doing it just to clean the car. I was doing it to look for the money there. So back to clean the cars. Uh, and uh, after I got I discharged from the church, I, I met a gentleman uh, in Doc Sol's, uh, uh store, in the drugstore there, big, tall gentleman, dressed well, and he was Reverend Moses Newsom. And he attracted us young fellows. I'd, even though I was a member of Simpson, 
but I liked Reverend Newsom and I attended his church. Uh, uh, Reverend Newsom uh, uh, took to me and I told him I may go into missionary work. The reason I wanted to go into missionary work, uh, there was a diner located next to Mr. Emory's parking lot. And I used to go there and swing around on the seats. I was a young kid, 13, you know. People never said anything to me. I never got to experience a lot of what segregation and, and I was about around Charleston because I was around people that because I was Mr. Herford's boy and, and these uh, white business people, Dr. Adams, you know, they knew me and people knew them. And so I wasn't sort of treated, I felt, like others. I didn't realize about that till later on. And my mother used to bring my lunch to me. I used to have gravy sandwiches for lunch, honestly. And uh, we had, the, she'd bring them in the old uh, wax uh, uh, paper uh, bags that the bread was in, and boy, the gravy smelled good. I swear, mother melted out, out, uh, out of the uh, grease that she cooked with. Uh, she uh, made lye soap. And that's how she washed her clothes. We had old scrub. Uh, she used to scrub the uh, clothes on us. The scrub, what you call it? Yeah, washboard. Yeah, washboard. Put it out in, in the sun, on hang it up with her close pins and come back in and heat that iron and we all had uh, beautiful clothes from that. But while I was attending uh, um, First Baptist Church one Sunday through the invitation of uh, Reverend Newsom, I dropped my bulletin on the floor and I went to pick it up and I saw this young lady's legs. <laughs> <laughs> And I, later on, I found out I met the love of my wife, Sarita Easley, who was uh, from Cabin Creek and also a student with Lou Myers, uh, whom I married several years later. I attended and graduated from West Virginia State College then. I was also an enthusiastic auto mechanic, and I drove stock cars at Dunbar, West Virginia, located near the college. I see it have changed it now. But the reason I got to drive cars there, the white gentleman that I worked and met that was repairing cars and I helped repair cars there, I used to attend the drag races with them and uh, still I was treated different because I was with some people that were known there so I was not the usual black youth there. Uh, but what happened, it changed my mind, um, the there's a diner, Coria Diner, located right next uh, to our parking lot across from WCHS Auditorium. And I said I used to run in there all the time, spin on the wheel of the seat there, wash back in the kitchen. So one day my mother brought my lunch to me. And uh, I told mom, I said, Mom, I, I got enough money out of the car seats that I was going to eat a full meal. I had my mother to eat a full meal. So I took my mother into Twin Diners. We went through the front door as I always go, and I told her to sit down. And the manager came up to me and said, uh, she can't sit here. And I was asking, I said, why? It's my mother. He said, they're not allowed to eat here. I'm telling you, they, you know, I've been coming there all the time, you know, eating at the, the Corrier Quinn, Quinn, the Quinn Diner. Uh, and uh, it created a tremendous hatred in my heart. And that's why I decided I'm going to Africa to do missionary work because my mother, whom uh, at that time raised all of the children and other cousins and from the country, uh, was not treated right. And so my mother did the strange thing to me when I came home one day to tell her my hatred and all my mother told me to go out in the backyard on Cent Street and get a, a limb off the tree. And I was wondering, I said, wonder what this is all about. She told me to bring the limb in there. And she pulled some of the branches off and <laughs> she'd whip it in front of me, you know. And uh, I hated my mother to always to lecture to me. She would give me a lecture 
before she'd tell me how much she loved me. <laughs> uh, and she was telling me because you're not leaving because I said something, are you, Miss? <laughs> I go to the church, so you know sometimes. Uh, uh, what happened? Uh, I I don't know why, but my mother gave me a lecture about love, uh, and she whipped me because I was trying to defend her because I told her what I went back in the kitchen and did at the restaurant, and uh, she whipped me like a champ. And each time she'd whip me and say, you know, I love you, you know, wouldn't take anything for you. But my mother had a strange way of correcting us. In my house on Cent Street, we had a hot water tank. It's not covered like y'all have it now, but you know how the old hot water tank for her. And she'd make you go in the bathroom and take your clothes off. And so she'd whip you toward the tank. And so you don't want to touch the tank. <laughs> <laughs> But that's the way she used to correct me, and that changed my whole life and changed my whole view. Because my mother and father at that time uh, uh, were separated. My father, being an orderly, worked for all the famous doctors, and they all wanted him to work with them. And so my father worked for a doctor who decided to go uh, up to Ohio to locate his business, and Dad went with him. And so I didn't see Dad until... Uh, I uh, finished college, was in the military again, until I asked my sister Ann and I, we found he was working on a chicken farm up in Lorraine, Ohio somewhere, and uh, Ann went up to get him and brought him back, and he stayed with Ann for about four months, and then later on, uh, he moved back in with mother. But my father came down with diabetes, had his legs amputated, uh, but... Uh, my mother still showed love, and I, I did my father's funeral, as I've done the funeral of all my brothers and sisters, I don't know why they call on me and my relatives. But when I came off of Spring Hill, where my father was buried, my mother said to me, uh, Paul, I've always loved your dad. And so that's why I've tried to correct you, because he was your father regardless. And these little things uh, that our parents teach us and all, now, my family was close to the Tyson family. Uh, this young lady here married in Easley in Virginia where my brother was uh, the, uh, the Episcopal priest. Would you stand a minute, Miss Tyson, so they'll know who you are. I want them to remember you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was surprising. It was surprising when I found out she was in Easley. I said, wow, you know. <laughs> But I apologize if I haven't said too much on that. <laughs> uh, uh, I met a Mr. Herford, Frank Herford, who took me in as his boy. He was a financier in real estate. And uh, he saw some talent in me. He wanted to put me in business. He said, Paul, there's a Texaco service station on the Kenora Boulevard near Patrick Street. And I'm going to buy that place, and I'm going to give you 49% interest in the business. And the first profit that you make, I'm going to give you an opportunity to buy into the business till you can own it. Well, uh, I accepted that, and Pete Christian, uh, who uh, worked with me there, I did the grease in the grease rack. Pete, Pete was a tremendous. I wanted to wash in cars, and we worked together. That's when you had to, when people got gas, you wiped their window down and put the gas in. They don't do that now, you know. Uh, but um, while I was there, my wife said to me, said, uh, Paul, uh, with all this education you're getting, I know we're not going to have just somebody running the service station, and I'm going to be cleaning up homes. we got to do more than that. Well, one day... A couple came by in a car and uh, where we were located near Patrick Street and uh, I went out I was greasing the cars at that time I went out to wipe the windows on the car and I stopped talking to them they asked me about me what I was doing and they didn't know that I was part owner of this station there 
But uh, I told them I was thinking about going into missionary work. And uh, they were so pleasant. They were trying to encourage me. Well, they left. Well, a week later, I got a letter from the Christian church in Terry Hall, Indiana. They had taken an offering to give to me, to help me, to support me, to go to college, to go to seminary. And after I explained that to my wife, uh, my pastor, the Reverend E.P. Clark, who was pastor at Simpson at the time, he was trying to encourage me because I was driving him. Now, he was a district superintendent. During that time of segregation, the Charleston district incorporated the whole state of West Virginia and part of Pittsburgh. And he had to drive to all of these churches himself. Uh, and so with agreement with my wife and the coordination of my pastor, Reverend uh, Clark, I applied and was accepted as a student at Gammon Theological Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia. And I made arrangements uh, to give my part ownership back to my sponsor, Mr. Herford. After graduating from seminary uh, in 1959, I was appointed pastor of Trinity Methodist Church in Fairmont, West Virginia, and later Ronsford, White Sulphur Springs, where Catherine Johnson uh, was a member of St. James Methodist Church, who was the, the lady with a NASA ast astronaut. Her family was a member of that church. Uh, Miss uh, Catherine Coleman Johnson was born in White Sulphur Springs in 1918. At the age of 18, she received her degree in mathematics in French from West Virginia State College, graduating summa cum laude. Uh, in 1962, uh, while serving there on the Ronsford White Sulphur Springs charge during the Cuban crisis, I was called to active duty as the first lieutenant in the United States Army Chaplain's Corps. And I first served at Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, later as a chaplain captain assigned to Korea as chaplain in the 1st Cavalry Division, which is located near the DMZ in Korea. My next tour was as a chaplain, brigade chaplain at 1st uh, Infantry Division, uh, retraining brigade in Fort uh, Raleigh, Kansas. Uh, while there at Fort Raleigh, I uh, attended uh, school and we had a retraining brigade there uh, where I was the first person assigned there. Uh, but uh, while assigned it uh, there, I uh, went to uh, Vietnam. I was supposed to have gone with the division, but my, uh, the, my the post commander, who was a general, saw some little talent and easily. A lot of the fellows you know must realize the fellows were drafted then. And we had a high rate of AWOLs, high rate of problems. We had a high rate of uh, uh, riots in the stockade and all. And I used to go in here, this young gentleman, not knowing all about it. I'd talk with the guys. And I talked a different language then as a, as a chaplain, which you had to, uh, to do. And so uh, somehow the fellow sort of looked up to me then, sir. <laughs> but uh, General Boatwright uh, took me off my orders for Vietnam with the 1st Division, but I later, later on went to uh, uh, Vietnam. And the military sent me, um, I spent um, a year at the uh, Federal Reformatory for Women. Let me drop back one thing. That's okay, sir. Uh, while I was at Ronsford uh, and serving a church there, the Federal Reformatory for Women was at Aldous in West Virginia. And majority of my members there at the Allison Church and some of the White Sulphur Springs worked there. So they encouraged me to go out there uh, to help assist uh, Chaplain Blackburn, who was a chaplain there. Well, uh, being a young student minister, I thought because of all the women who were coming to service, who was assigned there was, I met Axis Sally, Tokyo Rose, and Billy Holiday at the time. They were, they were uh, inmates there. And I thought, the ladies were coming because of this great preacher who <laughs> 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 used notes, you know, you know. Uh, uh, but uh, 
I found out it was a little different, you know, that really tore my ego up. <laughs> uh, our Methodist Church has a very unusual system. Uh, when we serve communion, we serve grape juice. So my first uh, church at Lewisburg, West Virginia, I was at Lewisburg and then came back to Ronsford. Uh, we had the four point circuits then, four point churches I served at. I went to this one search of the circuit to, uh, to serve communion, and we served communion. We had first and third service and second and fourth. The Methodists had first and third. The Baptists had second and fourth. Well, I went in there, and beautiful altar cloth was starched, ironed perfectly and all. The communion was up. We had about 20 members. And the strange thing was I noticed we had the communion cups were, uh, what you call those little glasses, sir? Shot glasses. Shot glasses. I apologize. I didn't mean to embarrass you a while ago, but I usually do that to get attention to my church when I'm preaching because the people sit down. I don't know why everybody's shaking like, and then they go to the restroom later on. <laughs> I forgot where I was talking about. <laughs> yes, okay, that's good. Thank you. And so uh, I, I, I went to take communion, and uh, uh, I noticed a lady had, uh, had the communion in a jar. And so I poured it in each of the jars there, you know. And in this uh, church uh, at Washington, uh, church they call it there there's a door on each side of the pulpit and so when uh, you want to go to the restroom of the outhouse they'd get up and walk out through the door and it was a draft because I had my notes one of the ladies went through there and all my notes flew up <laughs> you know, so I had to finish the sermon without the notes uh, but when I went to give communion I took a little bit of the communion there and and for a strange reason, it burnt all the way back. <laughs> so after service, I told the lady, I said, Miss, you know, we are Methodists, and we serve grape juice. And she said, well, you're the first minister to complain. <laughs> and then after the service, she gave me the bread. The bread was delicious, and the jar one of those cannon jars, she said, we always gave us to the minister. So I, I took it and left, but I never took communion there afterwards. I always, you know, act like I was taking a communion. <laughs> but uh, my wife and some of the members told me that was the best sermon they had heard in the That's how we work. Uh, there's a, another part. I want to share with you, uh, being a minister and being influenced uh, by the block, I had a topic here called the personal perspective of African American life in Charleston, West Virginia on the block, soul people. I want to talk about some soul people. And, and being a little minister, you have got to have a little scripture to back up what you're saying. So those of you that have your Bibles with you, <laughs> but I like the message translation and it says this a new life what a God we have and how fortunate we are to have him this father of our master Jesus because Jesus was raised from the dead we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for including a future in heaven and the future starts now God is keeping careful watch over us and the future the day is coming when you'll have it all, life healed and whole. I know how great this makes you feel, even though you have to put up with every kind of aggravation in the meantime. Pure gold put in far comes out of it proved pure. Genuine faith put through the suffering comes out proved genuine. When Jesus wraps this all up, it's your faith, not your goal that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. 
I grew up in a tradition that emphasized extemporaneous prayer. And not being a person who thinks well on his feet, I found myself intimidated. A person who thinks well on his feet, I found myself intimidated. Almost tongue-tied by unexpected calls to lead in public prayer. Always. In studying this verse in this Old Testament, I realize how much easier my life has been and how much richer my prayers have been if I begin my prayers, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, or similar phrases from the Bible. The scripture verse that I've shared with you, I want to speak to you about being soul people. That's all of us. In 1967, I had the opportunity to to visit uh, Detroit, a unit from Fort uh, Chaffee, Arkansas, from Fort Riley, Arkansas, I'm sorry, Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, I was there with a courier, and as a chaplain, I went to visit one of our units there. And we flew into Selfridge Air Force Base, and I visited 12th Street. But Isaac Hayes wrote a song called Soul Man. He was watching the news about the Detroit 12th Street riots. He noticed certain stores had painted on them soul, S-O-U-L. The rioters saw the sign, soul, and the rioters passed over them, and the property was saved. You dig me? This response wasn't ethnicity, but about identity. Black consciousness. Somebody had struggled through good times and bad times and yet remembered that they were part of the community. That's what the block did for us. Those in the hood were not looked down on. God help us, particularly in our living today, if we have no soul. God help us if we are people, if we are people with no soul. God help us to enlist men and women in our community who develop soul. Isaac Hayde said his Sunday school lesson kicked in when he sent, wrote that song. And it reminded him of a biblical passage about the blood of the lamb being marked on the doorpost. Because the death angel saw the blood on the door and they passed over it. Remember that. What Isaac Hayes, this R&B theologian, said, it wasn't about ethnicity, but identity. Because everybody who is your color is not your kind. It is said that whoever occupies these homes had a sense of black consciousness. Somebody who understood what it was like to get property and not forget where you come from. Somebody who had come from there to here through struggles and still could identify with the community masses in the area. Do you dig me? Somebody who hadn't come up easy and who hadn't been born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And somebody who had struggled through the good times and the bad times and yet remembered they were part of the community. They didn't ride in and look down their noses at the people in the community or still in the hood. And they still had soul. God, God help us if we are people who have no soul. God help us if we are men and women who have no soul or preachers and bishops who have no soul. God help us if we even church members who have no soul. God help us, we're thinking we're saints and have no soul. God help us if we claim to be religious and have no soul. If we're more concerned with the paycheck or expensive things and have no soul and not about touching people's lives, as the block did for each of us, We have no soul. 
If we are more concerned about pomp and ceremony and circumstance and good times than about people who are in need and who are lonely and young folk, even in our Charleston area, who are going astray and having problems, and we use misunderstood situations and things and means to satisfy their need for love and acceptance and communion. We have no soul if we are in any of those categories. If that is the case, you have no soul. But in the block were people, soul people, I hope you understand me. Soul people who took an interest in one another in each of us. I sometimes it's not about I found it's not what you're driving or the neighborhood you live in, but about what's driving you. Sometimes it's not about bling bling, but but what is real real. And sometimes it's not about God blessing you with big things and great worldly things, but it's about being in the midst of the struggles, struggles, in the midst of the pain. And that is why sometimes you've got to be careful when you ask God to bless you. You might be praying yourself right into a struggle. That's happened to me and other folk. Sometimes we think the time to shout is when we come out of things, but Sometimes I've found it in the midst of struggles, you've got to learn to shout. Because that's the assignment that God has put on our lives and the lives of those of you here tonight. What I love about the block and some persons I have known in the block is that in the midst of their pain, they would cling to their faith. God's hand was upon them. Wherever they were going through, whatever they were going through, they never lost their soul. A soul member. When you're a soul member, it doesn't matter what clothes you wear or money in your pocket or but it's what's in your heart. We come from people who know how to style even though we have nothing in the bank account. I've seen it on the block. People dressed up like a champ. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a witness in the building? <laughs> if you don't know anything about struggling or no bank account or having to wear hand-me-downs or mama having to go to the union mission or garage sale or got clothes that were hand-me-down from the people she worked for as pay or get shoes that were several size larger so that one behind could wear them or go barefooted until you get close to Sunday school or church. You get one block from the church to put them on so as not to wear them out before the next one could wear them. Don't know anything about government cheese, do you? And powdered milk and gravy sandwiches for school lunch and a brown paper bag or a brown bag saved from the store. If you don't, you don't know what it means to be a soul member. I don't know how poor we were, but we were so poor, we never used the OR. We were poor. <laughs> poor. And Mama used to say to us, when you leave this house, you're going to have clean clothes regardless of how old they are or how they may look or the style of the day. So don't be judging me by what you see because I still have soul. Soul, soul. Soul comes from the Greek word psyche. It has to do with your will and your affection. It has to do with your intellect and your spirituality. It has to do with your mentality and spirituality, meaning they are working together in sync. My grandmother was my first theology professor. 
she sat me down one day and asked me to read to her the 23rd Psalm that I had learned under Miss Norman's class. I articulated to her, and then she said to me, Paul, that was great. That was great. Now let me tell you what that means. That was wisdom. That's what the block gave us too. It gave us wisdom. Life can teach you some things that a Bible class or a college education can't teach you. Life can teach you how to handle the rough places in life. And I thank God for my mama and my grandmother, my friends that I've met, my relatives from the hood and from the block who taught me spirituality even though I had intellectuality. Listen, you know, your struggling doesn't mean you're not anointed. You may not know Kierkegaard's suspension of the ethical, but God does move in mysterious ways and has wonders to perform. Did you hear your mama say, my help cometh from the Lord? Just because you're struggling doesn't mean you're not anointed. Sometimes it is in those hard places that God gets the glory out of your life. I know we live in an age where everybody wants to be easy and convenient, but the truth of the matter, going through something is important. God brings out the best of us. And that's what the block did for us in trials and tribulations. You know, at my age, I sleep irregular hours. I wake up 12, 1, have to go to the bathroom at 2, 3, you know. I sometimes have reflex problems that are a result of my having eating pains late at night. And my daughter, who's a psychologist out in California, visited me and insisted, Dad, do not eat late meals. They're not good for your health. Well, I've been eating all this long. (laughs) (laughs) So I went to bed after she left me. I went to bed one evening about 11 o'clock. And I had an attack for a taste of a midnight snack, snack. So I went to the refrigerator and I opened the door to see what I could snack on. <laughs> My daughter had put me on a life modification plan. But my problem was I wanted a snack in the midnight hour. <laughs> well, when I do good, evil is always messing with me. And I could hear the refrigerator calling out my name, Paul, <laughs> Paul, <laughs> you need a snack. Do you read me? <laughs> now, I guess because of my hunger pains, food started to talk to me. At this age, a lot of things talk. We wonder, wow, gee. And I started to boil some water and I wanted to make myself some something good to eat. So I put on some boiling water. And I reached for an egg. So I heard the egg say something to me. Don't mess with me. Because if you put me in that water, it will make me hard. So I don't want a hard egg. So I reached for the potato. And the potato said to me, don't you reach for me. Because if you put me in that boiling water, I will become very soft and mushy. And then I said to myself, what shall I do? The water's boiling. And I heard out of the pantry, a word said, come and get me. I looked in the pantry and there was a tea bag. And it said, put me in there. And I said, why, tea bag, why? And it said, because when I'm in hot water and I get in over my head, that's just the right place for the best of me to come out. Do you dig me? Do you hear me? Have you ever been in hot water and God brought out some good things out of your life? You went through that, Miss Tyson, when you lost your sister. I'll never forget that on the road to Levi. And your brother Tyson had the accident on a motorcycle. 
Anybody here been in some bad times? Anybody here had to share some tears? Anybody here had to cry in the midnight hour all alone thinking you are in a deep, deep, deep pit? But God took your pain and blessed your life. I'm a witness. And I recall those people that I met on Cent Street on the block in my school, in my church, who gave me wisdom. And now it's coming to fruition. Well, out of all of this, somebody said to me, Paul, you going to sing? And no, I ain't going to do that now. But I thought of a song. It's called, How Firm a Foundation, You Saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith and His excellent word. What more can He say than to you who for refuge Jesus have fled? I read about that soul man long ago who was loved and despised and Forgotten and dismissed, even given a death sentence. He was put on an old wooden cross he had to carry by himself. He was mocked and speared on that cross. And he cried to his father above, it's finished. But the story didn't end there. Three days later, his mama went to the tomb, looked inside to find that it was vacant. He appeared in that upper room to those who thought it was the end. He said in a low voice, Fear not, it is I, a soul brother, a soul man of God. And we hear the voices of those on the block, those who have met, those who have gone through persecution, those who have had trials and tribulations. And they're saying to us, it is not finished. Because of you, Brother Kinza, we can be reminded of those individuals that have impacted our lives and those that impact the lives here. We are all soul brothers and sisters because of that soul man of God. God bless you and God love you. You're open for any questions or any comments if I can remember what I said. Do I understand that you said... This makes, this stay in a minute. I know we do that in school, but that's all, I know who they are. Hey, so I can hear you, they can hear you. Do I understand that you knew Catherine Johnson as a young girl? Is that what you were saying? No. She was a member of my church. Right. And I didn't know at the time she was going to be in Nassau. <laughs> nor, nor there's another relative of mine named Ann Easley, not my sister Ann. She also worked in NASA. She was from Birmingham, Alabama. I found that out in the tree. So, so uh, there were some, you know. And then, I, w- would you do me a favor too? I'm going to show off. Will my relatives please stand that are here? All my relatives. I got nieces. Oh, human and crickets. Yeah, I love you. Good to see you, God bless you. Good to see you. Good to see you. His mother uh, was uh, my aunt's, uh, Camilla's, had his daughter. His mother uh, was my cousin from my uncle, Eugene. And that's Russell. Uh, Russell. Now, my, my sister, uh, a- Alice, well, well, let me get us get with the, your your son, uh, Brother Hicks. Uh, athletic, athletic is a- athleticism. Is that right, Miss Tyson? Yeah, runs in our family. Um, Gene's son. Uh, was an outstanding basketball player at South Charleston High School. Yeah, that's. Will you stay in, day, Daniel, so they'll see you? Uh, my sister, uh, um, Ann, had uh, two sons who also played at South Charleston, outstanding in sports. But her daughter, Wilma Jean, held the state, or maybe still holds the state record for shot put. Uh, my uh, sister Alice had a son that uh, 
went to West Virginia State, Stonewall, it was All-American in Stonewall and all, played for the San Francisco 49ers, won the Super Bowl ring, played at West Virginia University. Um, I have now um, a grandson who's uh, 15 years old, six foot seven and a half, playing AAU basketball already. He's on his way to Las Vegas. They sort of recruit him early. That's my son's son. Uh, but God has blessed me in so many ways and blessed each of you. And uh, Brother Hicks uh, needed to use you for a lawyer some time back. <laughs> But it, it, I, I couldn't get what you're working in state, and I need you down in Georgia. But uh, I appreciate the opportunity, sir. Uh, you've been a blessing, and and I hope that helped answer your question, Miss. Yes, sir. You. Uh, Mrs. Norman, that you mentioned, did she teach English at Charleston High? Yes. 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 She was my teacher. Well, that's good. So that's why I see a lot of soul in you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's another reason that I received training at Fort Riley, Kansas, and I subsequently went to Vietnam, and you didn't miss a thing. <laughs> I went to Vietnam. Went. Oh, you did go. Oh, yeah, I thought I went you to... got your. I thought... Oh, no, no, they kept me from going from the division. I was a brigade chaplain. Now, while I was at uh, at uh, Fort Riley, Fort Riley, Kansas. We organized what they call a retraining brigade because we had so many guys going AWOL. So the commanding general kept me back because somehow, well, you know, I, I also was in the Olympics in 64. I used to box, you know, but the guy whipped me so bad I woke up the next morning. <laughs> I thought it was still dark. <laughs> Outside my eyes had closed up all the head. But uh, I was a chaplain then and I participated in sports. I was never outstanding like my uh, youngest brother was, uh, Robert. Uh, but And we didn't get to use uh, the thing, so that's okay. Sir, I apologize, you know. Yes, sir. Uh, the story that you told about your mother uh, providing you a lesson in, in humility. Uh, no, no. No. <laughs> that rang a bell with me because um, my parents were divorced when I was less than a year old. Wow. And I, I never, the first time that I met my fa father, I was an adult. And then really not too many times after that. But late, later in life, um, my mother declined in health. And, and so she was not going to be able to prepare Thanksgiving dinner like she always yes, did. Sir, yes, sir. And, so, and so the question was, <coughs> what are we going to do? And uh, I got a call from my brother. My brother had maintained a relationship with my father because he was older. Okay. And he said, uh, I have a question for you. And I, and I said, what's that? And he said, well, what would you think if, if dad, who, who was a yes. good, good cook, he said, dad wants to cook Thanksgiving dinner. And he said, well, what would you think about that? And I said, well, I don't think what I what I think matters at all. I said, it's what mom, what does mom think? And he said, well, I'll call him and talk to her. Just a few minutes later, he called me back and he said, she thinks it's a great idea. Yeah. Wow. And so uh, Thanksgiving Day, this is over 50 years later, you know, from when they were divorced. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And um, that day, I mean, it was, the rest of us just kind of sat back and watched the two of them reminisce um, only about the good times. You know, they there was no discussion about whatever, you know, whatever the bad things yes. that led to it. You know, and, um, and I talked to my mom afterwards and she said, you know, it's, she said, it's like, you know, life is too short to, to dwell, you know. Oh, man. I just saw his name up there. That's a tremendous test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a soul mama. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. When you were in uh, Congress, <coughs> did you ever have any thoughts about uh, they were, what's the name of it? Is it uh, Johnson? Yes, sir. She was a coal man, right? Yes, sir. She was a coal man. Okay. Well, yeah. her sister taught me uh, Margaret Cole. Oh, she didn't at the Bowling High School. Yeah, out there on the hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just. Yeah. That was in Lewisburg. Yeah. 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 Sir? What year was that? Oh, 60. Was, that was, uh, it's in 63. Oh, 
Okay, I, I had moved. Six to two. I had moved. Six to two, but I went on active duty. Yeah, I attended uh, Mount Taylor. My father was a pastor in Mount Taylor. That's how I moved the code. Yeah, that's right. I never realized it till uh, later on begin to read about her. I just found out this year. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yeah, hey, yeah. Uh, this gentleman here now, he's going to tell you, uh, I was his pastor, where now? John Webb. John Webb, my first church. First church. And, and he was on my baseball team, which was integrated then. We remember the two white boys we had? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We used to travel from Lewisburg uh, to uh, Charleston to play at uh, the old Cabo Field. And you had to come through Gully Mountain, man. I swear they, and we, I pack them all in the car. But well, we had a good time. Mercury. Yeah, Mercury. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Uh, Ms. Coleman was my teacher, too. Sir? Ms. Coleman was my teacher, too. Right. I remember. I remember. He was a lady. Yes, he was Ms. Mark Coleman. Yeah. But she never did mention anything too much about her sister. She she did. 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 did you go to Bowling? Uh, did you go to Bowling? Oh, who was oh, that? Oh, I know who that is. Graduated. In fact, the, uh, Mr. Clay, who was a principal there, his his uh, daughter and I graduated from West Virginia State together, and I used to bring her back to Lewisburg. Uh, yeah, surely, yeah, sure. And her husband's past. She lives in Alabama, oh, Tuscaloosa, yeah. Uh, hey, Paul, do yes. you remember Miss Thelma and Paul Thompson? Oh, I, I did I mention Mr. Hobson, too? Because he, li he lived on Cent Street, too. Oh, and Cent Street, Miss Thelma was a, was a school teacher. Right, yes. And Mr. Hobson was a librarian at Garnet. And he was in the military with us. Oh. He, he went on that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what I told you. Stand back. Yes, yes. Bring your chair right here, please. Bring him to this chair. Please. You're telling me to come up. Please. Danny? Danny! This chair. Somebody's calling you. Come up, somebody's calling Danny. you. Danny. <laughs> you know I'm too old to walk. Thank you. I'm doing fine. How are you doing? You doing? What we like to see now is uh, show a few pictures. I don't want to know. Randy, would you do up to Don't you put a little bit of projector? You can do it. We're in the middle of this. Let's use the one that says we're in the middle of the world. Let's go to the this is a picture my daughter uh, made of me, surprised me with several years ago. So we'll use that if you have some questions. You'll see my family uh, and uh, some excerpts of that. Thank you, sir. You did a good job. You yeah, go ahead. Just run that one. That's all. The, the film one? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We don't need to be done. You know what we need. Oh. Okay, go ahead and look at this. I am a Christian. I'm far from perfect Simply redeemed I Was bought with a purpose Purchased by love Not just a form of religion It's a gift from above I am not perfect Oh no I have been I'm just a believer Do you know what that means? It means I've pledged my life 
giving everything I never knew that this was meant to be Cause I'm not perfect No, 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 no But I have been redeemed Redeemed While I was yet in my transgressions Somebody paid the price for me Anthony asked me to present this to him. So here, 
<laughs> Whereas Reverend Paul A. Easley was born in Charleston, West Virginia, and graduated from Garden High School in 1950, and whereas Reverend Paul H. Easley served active duty with the West Virginia National Guard and received <coughs> his Bachelor of Science degree in Technical Science Building Construction at West Virginia State College, and whereas Reverend Paul H. Easley received a Bachelor of Divinity in Religion from Gamma Theological Seminary School in Georgia, clinical, pastoral education in psychology and counseling, and is retired, a retired member of the United Methodist Church West Virginia Conference, and Reverend Paul H. Easley was program leader for Branch Grand Y programs in Atlanta, Georgia, drug alcohol counselor, facilitator at the <coughs> Counseling Center in Kansas City, Missouri, and a chaplain at Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia, and Reverend Paul H. Easley was appointed first African American as Colonel of the Regiment of the United States Army Chaplain Corps, and whereas <laughs> Reverend Paul H. Easley was PTSA, past president of Terra High School in Atlanta and is a member of CRT of Georgia Tech. Ooh, obviously, I'm just going to get in it. Youth Hope Builders Academy and Fulton Leadership Academy and Woo. Whereas Reverend Paul H. Easley is a caring and giving person and his dedication and commitment to his community, church, and career has been an outstanding example to us all. Now, therefore, I, Jim Justice, Governor of the great state of West Virginia, do hereby bestow upon Reverend Paul H. Easley the certificate of recognition. Uh, given under my hand and the great seal of the state of West Virginia, the 27th day of July in the year of our Lord, 2017. Again, thank you all for coming, being here tonight. I thoroughly enjoyed myself, and I'm sure that you did too. Uh, thank you for your participation, and uh, look forward to seeing you again August 31st. Good night. Thank you. Yeah.
Uh-huh. Back on the 